So, uh, okay, so if we look at specific scenarios now of the different um, body regions, and this is something that you guys can quote me when it comes to the humerus, for me, uh, the only or the best option for managing humeral defects is shortening. And I'd like to say that there's no defect in the humerus that is too big to shorten. Um, a muscular is an option. Um, all the techniques we use in the lower limb, as in bone transport or shortening and lengthening with frames, works in the upper limb. But the problem in the upper limb is because of uh, the mobility of your joints and all the muscle, it thins a lot of muscle and you get a beautiful looking x-ray, but then you lose a lot of function with stiffness in the shoulder and the elbow. And certainly every upper limb frame I've, I've ever done, the patient ended up with some residual joint, joint stiffness. So I try and avoid frames in the upper limb as, as, much, as, as much as possible. And this is just a few examples of large um, shortenings. This is a infected non-union. As you can see here, it's not the only option, but there's, um, um, you know, uh, there's uh, other options as well. But for me, a single stage excision of the infected non-union, shortening, um, plating with a lot of uh, compression, and then simultaneous managing the infection with systemic antibiotics and some local antibiotic graft and, um, and, and union. There are some extreme defects, so extreme humoral defects. Um, Kirsty, maybe we can ask you, if you look at that x-ray on the left there, this is a guy with like a typical rollover injury with almost out of the um, out of the taxi. This is fairly recent, maybe about two, three years ago. Some of you might remember this case. Um, what do you think? What's the options there? I think, as you say, um, shortening and, and compression plating over there, although the distal fragment um, of the humerus is, is quite short, so you'd have to go into the metaphyseal um, region. Uh, but as you say, I, I think probably shortening, I, you might be able to consider masculine here. And I think in that article you sent, um, there's sort of a 50% um, Union rate with the with the mass. If I remember correctly, there were a lot of stats, but um, masculine here as well. Um, I don't think a, an X fix um, is a good option here. Um, if the soft, if there was good soft tissue management, so I, I, it looks like he's had a flap of some sort with all the clips there. Um, but yeah, I think either shortening or masculine type um, yeah, technique. I think that's the main, the main two options. So. Um, this was before I was involved. So the patient was a sort of short in the X fix. The problem just with a monoplanar X fix um, for the time that this will take to unite is not stable enough. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the X ray here on the left is now six months later, where he has a non union still with the residual um, cap. Um, you can see that he had a severe sort of soft tissue injury as well. So his shoulder, he didn't have good shoulder function, but no, normal hand function amazingly. And his shoulder sort of chronically subluxed and he's lost all his deltoid and, and, and irritated cuff, but good elbow and hand function. And here further shortening. And you can see here that this is a, a eight hole plate and it covers the whole humerus. And there you can see um, he's got Fair, he's got good hand function and fair elbow function, no shoulder function, but um, you know, this is the best that you can do. And you know, if you go back to the literature or some old test books, some people would use numbers like four centimeters, the maximum to show. I don't think that was ever scientifically proven. That was just people, you know, thumb sucking. You can shorten the limb as much as it can tolerate. Large shortenings, you must also watch out for venous congestion, but this is probably a, a 10 plus shortening in the, in the, in the, in the humerus um, with, you know, with success, basically. And the forearm, the form is a little bit more difficult because shortening is not all option or you can't shorten um, more than, you know, a few millimeters, basically, because of the two bones. And so for me, um, the first option in segmental defects in the forearm is structural uh, tricortical autograft. Important here that it does seem that the tricortical autograft only heals uh, if under compression. So if you use a structural autograft, 
in the management of a, a forearm defect or whatever defect is important that you fix it with compression and very stable. Otherwise, it doesn't. A single bone forearm is another technique that's described in severe um, cases where you just convert the forearm to a single bone. You usually use the one with the smallest bone loss, or sometimes you plate the classic in describers plating the radius onto the onto the ulna. But there's many sort of hybrid uh, techniques. The one nice thing about bone defect is as a part of orthopedics again, where you can use some creativity. There's often not a single off-the-shelf solution for most of these cases, and you just have to be a little bit creative and and come up with solution specific to the patient. So this is a 32 year old female, comminuted radius ulnar fracture plated, you can argue uh, not perfectly, but six months down the line, no signs of healing. Um, you can just see on that ulna, there's a, there's a, a butterfly segment that looks a bit sclerotic. And the problem is even just after trimming the edges, you end up with a significant segmental defect. And so here on the radius, um, we just have some cancellous graft and revision plating with compression, but on the ulna structural, um, ulna tricortical structural graft from the iliac crest. And that is the patient at union showing nice consolidation. You can see here from the little bit of shortening of the humerus, um, this is sort of a little bit of a gap, but um, proximally, but without any consequence of patient, but you literally cannot shorten more than a few millimeters in the in the forearm. This is a another sort of extreme case of a rollover injury with large bone loss in the distal radius and the ulna. Um, this was initially when the patient was X-fix um, by the hand steam and they tried masculate. One of the, the sort of prerequisites for masculate to work is you must have very stable fixation. That's why I said I mostly like to do it in combination with internal fixation. If it's possible, like specifically nails in the femur or the, or the humerus, um, if you use an external frame, you have to make it very stable, preferably circular external fixator. You can see here, even though the graft sort of started to consolidate, it, 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 um, it didn't fully consolidate and the X fix started to fail in this case. So um, then the patient referred to me. So what I did here, you can see that um, of the two bones, the radius had the largest bone loss. And so we decided to, or I decided to utilize the ulna here because the ulna, um, the ulna had a smaller defect basically. So I put the patient in a rail. Um, did a corticotomy, transported the ulna distally till the ulna was in line with the corpus and then centralized the corpus uh, or line up the corpus with the, the fourth ray with the ulna and did an arthrodesis. Um, so an ulna carpal arthrodesis. And then you can see the union of the patient with fair also had the radial forearm flat. Because you, you're never going to have perfect function of the injury like this, but with fair function um, and a stable arm of the injury. This is another one. This patient was referred to me at three months. And this X fix, if you just look at that, it's just a mess, uh, some radial bone uh, loss. Um, don't see what's going on there in the, in the, in the corpus again. And uh, basically, a large, uh, some bone loss on the radius, so a large defect. And what I did here was I reconstructed some of the distal radius, good bone, took the proximal, uh, the, the proximal row capectomy and did a arthrodesis of the radius onto the capitate and also resected the distal ulna. So actually this bone that's plated there onto the radius is the distal ulna and recreated a basically a, a variation of a single bone forearm. And this is him at two years with a functional, functional hand with, with union of the, of the defect. So there's no one single off the shelf solution for most of these cases, but you can use a variety of, of techniques to come up with a sort of a create, creative or an individualized um, technique. So in the femur, as I said, I try and avoid 
external fixate in the femur as far as possible and the femur masculine as an option is the case that I showed earlier. Bone transport, if you do do bone transport, we use the rail because the circular frames around the femur is not great. Only use a circular fixation, fixator in the femur if there's a simultaneous uh, deformity that needs to be corrected. So this is another case of a chronic osteitis with a pathological fracture. The poor host, here you can see after segmental resection, um, there is a, a large defect of the femur. Um, here I did bone transport from distal to proximal because of the short proximal segment and the osteotomy here. Um, you can see here, even at the time of removal of the spacer, there was some ossification in the periosteum, which is a good sign. It means that that uh, membrane is well vascularized and there's actually some, some bone formation in the, in the induced membrane. Um, distal to proximal transport, open docking procedure. And here you can see um, the patient at union. You can't see the dates here though, but between the initial application of the X-Fix and the, and the removal when he was united is 18 months. So that is the problem with uh, long bone transport is the time, the time uh, in a frame. So as I said in the tibia, masculine um, for me is not a good option except for very small defects. Bone transport works brilliantly in the tibia, frames are well tolerated and um, uh, well tolerated and, uh, and the, there's a predictable result for the patient. I can say 90% sure you will have a successful reconstruction of the bone defect. And I can say what time frame. If it's four centimeters, it's gonna be four to eight months in the frame. Hybrid, and consider hybrid techniques for bigger defects. And these are mostly um, first lengthening of transport and then followed by internal fixation. So just a case to show that um, everything doesn't always go according to plan. So Santa, this is more or less in line with your earlier question. You can see that this patient was in an X-fix for 18 months. And um, I, won't I won't mention the secondary hospital, but he had monthly X-rays for 18 months um, for uh, people waiting for this to heal. This is not a non-union, this is a bone defect you know, and this will never heal by just watching it. So this needed a planned second procedure in the acute setting to reconstruct the bone defects, whichever technique you choose. But um, um, basically osteoblasts don't jump. So, um, you know, the, a, a segmental defect is never going to heal or very seldomly heal spontaneously. So same story with him, um, bone transport, did an open docking procedure in him. Looked like it was healing, but then at frame removal, he has a non-union of his docking site. Luckily now his soft tissue was completely healed. We gave him a, a short frame holiday and then inserted a, a tibial nail um, across the non-union of his docking site uh, with compression and he united, he united well. Very important, we're not talking about complications. So the success rate of all of the surgery is reported in the literature, and I can confirm that as 80 to 90% success rate in the appropriate selected cases. So these are good host patients. And um, if you attempt these reconstructions and poorer hosts, your success rate is going to be lower. Um, specifically, you have to prepare the patient for the worst. You have to tell them, in the beginning that if you fail the reconstruction that um, they will most likely end up with an amputation and uh, they need to sign up for the for the uh, for the treatment uh, there's no treatment for this type of problem with a hundred percent success rate so as i said the important things to take home is the definition of a critical defect critical defects are not only segmental defects include any defect that's not going to heal spontaneously. And even in the acute phase, you might not do something in the acute phase, but you must have a plan to address the defect, a second sitting with bone graft a few weeks later or muscular or whatever. Uh, you cannot just have one technique that's going to work for all defects and all bones. You need to have a variety of, 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 of defects, and then you need to be able to select the individualized treatment 
to select the appropriate option for, uh, for each case. And that's it. Thank you very much. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions or any cases? Um, <laughs> oh, we even have Prof done on the call here. <laughs> any questions? Any of the cases? Anyone has any cases that they want advice on? Okay, nothing. So I think that's enough for a Thursday evening. Thanks for joining, guys. And and again, apologies for the for the rescheduling for the tattoo this evening. Thank you very much.